um, on behalf of the UN Red Program, welcome to the session titled Gender, the Key to Unlocking Transformational Change in Climate Forest Finance. Uh, my name is Amanda Bradley, and I'm a, a gender focal point for the UN Red Program from FAO. I, along with my, my colleague, Victoria Suarez, a fellow UN Red gender focal point from UNEP, will be co-moderators for the session. So wherever you are, we're really excited to have you here with us. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, before we get started, there are a few housekeeping issues that I would like to uh, quickly go over. Um, first, uh, please note that the session will be recorded for further dissemination through our channels. Uh, we have simultaneous interpretation in English and Spanish on the Zoom platform. You can choose your language in the button in the bottom menu bar through the globe icon on the bottom right hand side. Please uh, note that if, if uh, needed, you can mute the original voice by clicking on mute original audio. Uh, next slides, please, Jessica. Uh, So um, just a few additional items. So please ensure that your microphone is on mute and, when you're not speaking. <laughs> and uh, please keep video on if your bandwidth allows you to do so. Uh, we kindly ask that you limit your distractions when possible. And uh, we would love to hear from you. And so please provide comments and questions when you have them either in the chat box or on the democracy wall. So you may be wondering, what is the democracy wall? Uh, next slide, please, Jessica. So um, for the democracy wall, we will be using Mural, as you see illustrated here. Uh, the link to the democracy wall can now also be found in the chat box. You can enter the democracy wall as a visitor and then choose one of the, the columns you would like to put a comment in. We have noted three columns, uh, one for comments, then one for questions, as well as one for sharing your existing work examples. While we do have a, a great lineup of speakers today, we are also here to learn and hear from the participants on any case studies and work examples that you'd like to share with us. Uh, this topic's really important, so the more knowledge we can share with one another, the better. Uh, this democracy board will be available to access and edit even after the event for uh, two to three days, so please don't hesitate to share your work examples with us there. Uh, any web links and organization names that you can provide would also be most appreciated. Uh, feel free to share with us your work in either English or Spanish. Uh, for those questions raised, which we can't address in the question and answer session today, we plan to follow up with a note addressing these questions, which will be shared via email with all the registered participants. Uh, we welcome and encourage all feedback, so please don't be shy. Uh, next slide. Um, now you should all see on your screens the overview for today's session. Um, we, will, we will be having welcoming remarks followed by two presentations. Uh, then we will have a 10 minute question and answer session. This question and answer session will be followed by three more presentations and then another question and answer session. If you have any questions, once again, please either note them in the chat box in Zoom or on the democracy wall, which can be found in the link to mural within the chat box. Now uh, to start the session, it's my great pleasure to invite Mario Bacucci, the head of the UN Red Program Secretariat to deliver welcoming remarks. Mario, you have the floor. Please turn on your video. Oh. And unmute. Thanks. Oh. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amanda. I think my video is on. I hope you can see me. 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> good. Uh, very good. And and really, this is to extend a warm welcome to everyone and to say how grateful uh, we are for all of you joining. And what I really just wanted to share was some quick, rapid reflection on what I see from the vantage points that I have being the head of the UN Red Program Secretariat that has been working for the, the program has been working for the past 10 years on forests and climate. And so the, the first consideration I have is really on an amazing shift in the context that we are seeing. And just to paraphrase from a, a, a Chinese saying that I think you all know, it's about planting trees, but I would turn it into, you know, the, the best time to operationalize gender equality principles and women empowerment principle into finance and forest action was 30 years ago. But the second best time is now. <laughs> and this is why, because we're really seeing a massive shift. We are moving from an era of goodwill and negotiations on climate actions in general, but also very specifically recognizing the forest solutions and actions to conserve and restore forests are essential to achieve the climate objectives, but now they're also essential to address other planetary crises, biodiversity, the COVID socioeconomic recovery, but also you know, as a shield to keep forests as a shield for the emergence of future pandemics. So there is a strong recognition that forest actions on forest are of the essence. And now there is a strong recognition that those actions are taking place already, but they need to be scaled up. And to be scaled up, we need to see finance flowing into the forest action space at a scale and at a speed that we have never seen before. And you know that this is gonna be a big topic for discussion in Glasgow next week, and subsequently, how do we leverage finance at a scale that we have never seen? As we do that, it's very important that the future finance that is gonna flow into this space is designed and it's managed in a way that applies the principle of gender empowerment and gender equity, and therefore, this is why it is of critical importance that we start positioning the gender, forest, climate, finance nexus, not as a generic discussion, but very specifically with a concrete how to, how to operationalize these principles. And this is where this session today I think is very timely and very important because we will hear from a number of colleagues that will share their experience, that will demonstrate and will, and will show how things have been done to really shift and leverage that finance in a way that is gender responsive and empower women. We will hear where are the knowledge gaps that we need to rapidly fill so that we can make a stronger case for gender sensitive finance at scale in the future. And finally, just to say that as you and Red, you know, we have been operating in this space for many years. We um, have been a partner to all of you and many others at the global level where we have been, uh, 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 you probably have seen our gender policy brief. Um, we have also activated to walk the talk from our side, a gender marking rating system to really be able to assess the gender inclusion and the gender impact of the actions that we take as a program. So we feel we are very well equipped to work with you in this space. We see these events not as a one-off, but a first of a series of exchanges that will rapidly connect all of us and allow us to make a powerful, case 
for greater attention and greater inclusion of and full inclusion and uh, um, um, resolving the many obstacles that we have seen in the past for gender responsive gender equity and women empowerment in forest action to be scaled up in the coming 10 years. So big thank you to all of you uh, for being here. And I really look uh, forward hearing from all of you and I will be coming back at the end of the session. Back to you, Amanda. Mario, thank you so much for those uh, inspiring words for, for setting the scene for us and, and highlighting some of the key issues, basically why this topic is so important and especially at, at this critical time. So we've been really fortunate, fortunate to have your support and guidance for all the, the UN Red work on gender, including for this event. So um, next, I'm, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Titi Sontoro, who will deliver our first presentation. Uh, Titi is the Executive Director of AXI for Gender, Social and Ecological Justice. Uh, she's based in Indonesia. She, she's uh, going to showcase awareness raising and advocacy efforts surrounding climate finance, women's rights, and the rights of indigenous peoples. Uh, particularly in her organization's role as a civil society observer to the Green Climate Fund. Titi, uh, you have the floor. Uh, please turn on your video and unmute. Thank you. So thank you, Amanda, for the introductions. And greetings from Indonesia. Right now it is evening in my place, but good morning and good afternoon wherever you are. So Amanda already informed me about my task to present today. And uh, I would like also to thank UN Red Program for the invitation and allows me to share our advocacy work on gender and climate finance, including forest finance. In my presentation, I will focus on gender mainstreaming as our advocacy strategy. Uh, Jessica, the next uh, slide, please. So uh, our strategy is grounded in the agreed conclusion of ECOSOC in 1997 that defined gender mainstreaming as you can read in the, on the slide. So then the key, the important key in our interpretation of this definition is the assessing the implication for women and men of any plan action in all the levels that uh, related. And the second is uh, inclusion of women as well as men concerned as an integral part of the whole project cycle. And then the two aspects would lead to the gender equality. So it means we need also to take care that any intervention would not lead to gender inequality. Then uh, in Indonesian context, the Indonesian government adopted this uh, definition through a presidential order number nine of the year 2000 on gender mainstreaming into the, the development. So the basis of our strategy is assessment of implication, inclusion of concern and experience and avoiding gender uh, inequality. So then uh, with this framework, we look at any project interventions, whether it is forest intervention or climate or other development uh, projects that come to Indonesia. So uh, next slide, please. To make it uh, more sense what, what we mean with that. Uh, Jessica, next slide, please. So I will give you an example from our advocacy regarding climate finance. And in this case is the UNDP proposed projects to the GCF titled 
uh, FP130 Indonesia Red Plus for Result Based Payment tabled and approved by the GCF board meetings on September 2020. So we must admit that the gender assessment was comprehensive to look at the Indonesian uh, uh, policies and institutional setting related to gender and women's empowerment. And then uh, the core of the gender assessment is the situations that women face is limited access to decision making, less access to extension of our capacity building activities, and women do not have a space, sufficient access to information. Next slide, please. So based on this assessment, then the project proponent built up the gender action plan. Next slide, Jessica. Thank you. Apologies, there is a bit of a delay with the slides. <laughs> oh, yeah. No worries, no worries, it's okay. So we can see the gender action plans uh, built from the gender assessment and uh, mainly about targets, you know, as you can read in the slide, there's a target to uh, have uh, the, 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 the subnational government involved in the gender responsive benefit sharing, uh, women participation, and so on. And also uh, women who receive investment and so on. So the gender achievement based on this target, there were also more detailed information on how to do that. Next slide, please, Jessica. And we as the GCFCSO observer, we study this uh, we, because the group study many things, but we specialize, I mean, me and some other uh, women look at specifically the gender aspects. So gender assessment, gender action plan, and our intervention to the board uh, meetings uh, stated that actually the target mentioned in the gender action plan were not ambitious enough. You know. And then we are aware there is a slow progress on gender mainstreaming in Indonesia, uh, which is since 2000, where the presidential order was issued. So then we question, so if even the Indonesian government is so slow. So how the uh, UNDP and the uh, uh, implementing entities in Indonesia will achieve better than the Indonesian governments? So we know the slow progress because we just accomplished, we, it means AXI, just accomplished a gender assessment on our national and four cities climate policy and actions through among others interviewing government official. So we really know what is happening with the gender mainstreaming uh, policy. Uh, next slide, please. So then uh, this gender assessment and action plan is an example how most climate and development intervention overlook many other aspects of the assessment of implication and the inclusion of concern and experience. So uh, this overlook, uh, uh, this overlook uh, situations it would create another burden to women who are already facing difficult situations under the intertwined powers of patriarchy, neoliberal development model, militarism, and fundamentalism that we are facing in Indonesia, for example, and I think in many other developing countries as well, uh, too. And then, uh, you know, then based on the three, uh, on the framework that I told uh, 
in the beginning. Then we have our gender assessment on a project intervention tools to look how it is, you know. It's, uh, of course, it is about representation uh, of involvement, assessment of access and control over resources, education, care work, and so on. So those, uh, the, the tools that we use. But to make it simpler to understand is, for example, the questions. Uh, the, the examples of GCF uh, uh, FP130, the red for RBF in Indonesia, do not, doesn't provide information about how the proceed of the RBF would, for example, benefit women to the same extent as men or lead to more balanced distribution of public resources among women and men. And uh, whether uh, will the, pro the, the proceed will not increase the domestic burden of women by, by doing the public care work. And then whether the proceed will promote gender justice or recognize the needs of illiterate and provide the illiterate uh, communities with appropriate forest related uh, information. And whether the, the, uh, the proceed will also enforce to, to change the mindset of patriarchy, which is centrality of my male lifestyles and way of thinking, you know, uh, you know, to be more women, uh, women, uh, not women friendly, but more empowered uh, women and include the way of women's thinking. So those questions are examples on how we analyze the projects and advocate for the application of gender, meaningful uh, assessment and inclusion of women uh, experiences and concerns. Next slide, please. Titi, yes. sorry, very sorry to interrupt, but just to let you know that um, there's about one minute left. Thank you. Okay, Thanks. so the next slide is only to give examples of our activities. So capacity building for Indonesian NGO, engagement with the Indonesian NDA, and uh, policy recommendation of NG, uh, how to engage with the NDA at national level. So uh, that's a short description regarding our framework, our advocacy and activities on climate finance recently in the GCF. Thank you, Amanda and Jessica, uh, back to you. Thank you so much, Titi. And uh, yeah, I wish we, we had longer to listen um, a bit more, but it, it's really great to, to hear about what you, you and Axie have been doing to represent uh, women and, and gender issues in the GCF. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who is uh, Karen Erickson. Karen is a, a program specialist on gender e equality at the Swedish International Development Corporation Agency, or, or CEDA. Uh, Karen is gonna to speak to us about CEDA's approach to mainstreaming gender um, and, uh, and how this can be transformative. Karen, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the invitation to this event. And yes, I will uh, share with you about CEDA work with uh, gender mainstreaming and also share with you where we are in our learning process uh, today of understanding how we can more efficiently integrate the gender equality work and work for uh, climate change and a sustainable environment. Uh, so I work, uh, we can go back please. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to say first that I work as a program specialist with a team that is implementing CEDA strategy for global gender equality and women's and girls' human rights. And here it's a high quarter 
uh, CETA's headquarters in Stockholm. We are currently exploring and strengthening the knowledge exchange uh, with our colleagues that work on climate change and environment. Um, because we have seen and believe that this strength and collaboration will create possibilities for better analysis uh, that underpin the development of our strategies and hopefully also open up uh, for different kinds of programming and other kinds of innovations uh, that will bring different actors together. Because um, knowing that innovation happens when we do bring people with different experiences and knowledge together. So next one, please. Uh, so CETA's model for uh, mainstreaming looks like this. And we have this in place to ensure a gender sensitive assessment of program and project proposals as well as it ensures that women and girls, as well as men and boys, concerns, needs and experiences are part of implementation, monitoring and evaluation of programs and policies to ensure equality in the contributions and benefits from development efforts. And CEDA also works with, uh, promotes gender responsive budgeting. And I can say that 20% of CEDA's total development cooperation uh, is uh, targeted, which it means that its main focus uh, is on uh, promoting gender equality. And 68% of CEDA's total development cooperation is integrated. And CEDA voluntarily reports the level of gender integration in both its climate finance and its biodiversity related support. And we do this to highlight the importance of gender equality in climate change and environmental work. And we hope to inspire and influence other donors to do the same. And in 2019, the level of gender integration uh, in climate finance was uh, climate finance support was approximately 84% and 90% in uh, bio biodiversity related support. CEDA also highlights the need to apply a gender transformative approach that actively examines questions and challenge gender rigid, uh, rigid gender norms and imbalances of power. And CEDA also has an action plan in place for gender equality that, for example, state the need to increase funding for women's rights organizations. Next, please. And I mentioned that uh, because we uh, have seen in uh, all the investments that CEDA does, uh, in investing energy and resources to support gender responsive uh, climate change and forest climate finance. Um, we have seen that gender inequality is one of the main challenges to advance the environmental and climate change dimensions of sustainable uh, developments. And here we are now, we hear, heard that Mario talked here in the beginning that we, so we are in a new era. We see multiple crises coming together and so here we learn and we have reflected and I'm sure you recognize many people today talk about that we need a systemic approach. We need uh, to work a transformational change, which is also the headline of this event. So then we need to ask ourselves, how do political, social, economical and technological paradigms and structures transform from one state to another? How does this change occur? And what is our role in, in the process of transforming structures and paradigms that are creating climate change and environmental degradations, as well as gender inequalities and violations of women's and girls' rights? So what do we have in common uh, coming from a gender equality perspective or climate change uh, work? Uh, that what systems are the ones that needs to be changed? Uh, and this change we know needs to be deep and fundamental. So it disrupts the status quo and lasts over time. But the direction of the change needs to be defined. So how do we define our common transformational goals? Next, please. And please advise me when I have one minute left. Um, as you might know, Sweden uh, was the first country to adopt a feminist uh, foreign policy in 2014, and it was strained and to strengthen its implementation, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and CEDA developed a dedicated strategy for global gender equality in women's and girls' rights. 
And through this strategy, we have had the possibility to develop partnerships with global women's rights and feminist organization, which has allowed us uh, to support actions um, also involving men and boys uh, in the work for gender equality and in addressing trans for uh, addressing and transforming destructive masculine norms. And one such partner is Men Engage Alliance. And with support from CEDA, they are currently advancing work on developing a deeper understanding of boys and men's multiple roles in climate change by conducting an analysis of masculinities in patriarchal systems that play a contributing role in perpetuating climate change. And by engaging in these partnerships, uh, CEDA increase our knowledge, understanding of the relationship between gender justice and environmental justice. This has also meant that we are now collaborating more with colleagues working with climate change and environment. Uh, we also support the increased involvement of women's rights movement with indigenous women and their organizations. These organizations that CEDA supports also identify and explain why and how we need to and can work with transformative system changes. Many actors from the feminist and women's rights movement focus on the root causes of climate change and environmental degradation and identify societal structures that have caused climate change and the environmental crisis, these being patriarchal structures, racism and colonialism, arguing and showing that systematic human rights violation also cause and fuel environmental crisis. Uh, Karen, sorry yeah. just, uh, to let you know that there's about one minute. All right. So yeah. then we can go to the slide that uh, says CEDA supported climate change and forest protection initiatives, please. Next one. So engaging in the development of transformative and transformational systemic approaches, uh, we're learning from uh, the, the many uh, climate change and forest protection initiatives that CEDA supports. Uh, climate change, environment, and biodiversity being highly prioritized areas uh, of the Swedish gov government and CEDA. And we are the fifth, uh, country, Sweden is the fifth largest contributor to this, the Green Climate uh, Fund. And uh, has been, CEDA has been very instrumental and actively engaged in developing this gender policy. And we have uh, support to global and regional uh, programs with the for forest and farm facility, uh, which is promoting uh, women's economical empowerment. Um, and here I also want to highlight that, that CEDA also recognizes and is learning from uh, research that says that showing that promoting women's economical empowerment is not enough to shift unequal power relations. We need to combine different strategies. And in Asia uh, and the Pacific region, uh, we have uh, an interesting um, st uh, strategy in place where we, for example, have uh, worked together with an organization that's also here in the panel, uh, WOKAN, a Women Organizing for Change in Agriculture and Natural Resources that was procured to provide expertise and hands-on support to environmental organizations to be able to actually mainstream uh, gender into their uh, forest climate projects. So finally, uh, well, we have many conclusions uh, that we have drawn from this and this uh, learning journey is to be continued. Uh, and we, uh, we can see that in general terms, we need to combine uh, having like revisiting the, the, the starting point to make sure that we look at what are the aspects that we need to work with to really reach a transformational change both from an environmental perspective and a gender equality perspective. And then when we come to how we, we program, there are also many technical aspects to take uh, into account. And here I think dialogue and networking, peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange cannot be underestimated. There is so many knowledge with partners coming from different perspectives. So we really need to, to improve how we create the platforms, uh, strengthen uh, platforms for joint learning and uh, programming. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Karen. CETA plays such a key role in, in moving this agenda forward and uh, its commitment to gender trans, uh, transformation. It, it's really a, a game changer. Thank you again. Um, next, I'd like to pass the floor to my fellow UN Red uh, Gender Focal Point, Victoria. She's going to facilitate our first uh, question and answer session. Victoria, the floor is yours. Thank you, Amanda. In this question and answer section, we would like to hear more from the participants, your comments, your reflections, the questions you may have. Uh, first of all, we would like to have a chat wave. So we will share a question with you, uh, which is, what is your biggest takeaway from the first two presentations that we just heard? I would like you to put your question in the chat of this webinar. And when I say go, you all click enter so that we receive all your answers, reflections at once. So what is the biggest takeaway from these first two um, presentations that we just heard. I'll give you um, a minute to think about it and to post your um, answers. And then I will tell you when to click the send button. So again, the question is, what is your biggest takeaway from the first two uh, presentations that we just heard from um, Tiki and Karin a moment ago? And now I will please tell you to send your answers. This is a go. So we are, we are reviewing an interesting answers like the importance of gender equality agenda and link to environmental issues, uh, defining goals-oriented approaches, multiple ap approaches at a systemic uh, impact, some examples like Sweden's um, feminist poli uh, foreign policy. So thank you very much. We will take into account all these inputs and, and comments from your side. Now, um, I would like to continue receiving uh, questions uh, or comments you have, uh, but particularly questions for the two presenters. Could you please uh, put your questions in the chat? And also, uh, we have time for one or two uh, persons to uh, verbally share their questions. So if you could raise your hand, if you want to um, speak up your question to the two presenters, to one or the other, um, please raise your hand. You can raise your hand by going to the reactions um, bottom at the end, at the bottom and the right part of the screen. And let me know if you want to um, share your question with all the participants, or if you prefer, you can post them in the chat. I do not see any, any questions at this moment. Um, I would like, also like to remind you that at any point during this webinar, you can go to the democracy board and put some additional information in the comment section and um, in the case studies or experiences that you have uh, or organizations you know of, and you can share that information even after this webinar. The democracy board will be open for that.
I see there are no questions at this moment or no, uh, I see a hand. Yeah, let's say Victoria, yes. there's one hand. Mm -hmm. uh, please, uh, Hawa, I don't know if I'm, I'm saying correctly your name. Would you mind sharing your question? Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm pleased to be part of this uh, meeting. Um, I'm the gender and livelihood officer with the National Red Plus uh, uh, program in Nigeria. And um, from the presentation so far, I have actually uh, come to realize that, you know, putting up a, a gender a responsive uh, program in place, it, it wasn't an easy task for me here, but um, I needed to also uh, ask whether if those presentations by the two presenters uh, will be shared with us for further uh, reference to our work as we, we fight, we, we carry on this fight for the gender uh, rights in my country. Okay. Thank then you. Then yes. My, mm -hmm. Then my second question is: um, um, We have uh, conducted our gender equality strategy, and uh, also with uh, our actions put in place. But because of insufficient uh, funding, uh, I couldn't. Uh, we couldn't implement any of these actions, and I needed to know how do we access funding on on how to implement these actions. Maybe if there could be any link on how we can access funding to be able to to implement those actions. Those are my two questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, um, would you mind muting your, your microphone, uh, Howa? Um, yes, we will be sharing all the materials that uh, will be gathered in this webinar with all the participants. Uh, and now I would like to give the floor to the two presenters for answering uh, if you have any other recommendations on how to put a gender uh, responsive program in place uh, first, and secondly, how to access funding for implementing actions that could be included in a gender equality strategy. Karin or Tiki, do you have any reflections on these two questions? Uh, I cannot answer the second questions because uh, we don't work on the uh, funding issues, but more on the advocacy. But uh, I think one of the, usually the policy or program are designed without, at national level or international level, without involving the women's groups, you know? then it is important that uh, any intervention related to the forest, there is a need to communicate with women's groups of the country because they can provide a lot of input and experience and the real need from the ground. That is my, uh, my suggestions to the forum. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tiki. Something to compliment, Karim, from your side? The second question is it's not so it's not very easy to answer uh, not knowing the the context uh, uh, where the the question comes from. Uh, we I think we all know that the the funding landscape uh, is rather complex and there are many different channels to to access funding. And uh, I can only say that. Uh, we know uh, her studies has shown us that um, about 10 percent i believe of funding for climate finance is reaching the the local level so there is a challenge on for 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 donors and uh, and global programs to look at how we make sure that more funding actually reaches the local level um, and that's also true for women's rights organizations that are also very important actors uh, for 
uh, in uh, climate change work, where only about 1% of the, of the general uh, governmental funding uh, reaches the women's rights organizations. So that is something that is uh, being has been flagged to the international donor community and there are initiatives promote working on that to 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 increase that percentage. So I, I'm afraid I cannot give any more any concrete advice here, but I, I believe in, in the context where you are, you can hopefully reach out to, to other organizations to, to get some orientation on where to find uh, both technical support and, and funding. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, all the questions that we received that uh, remain unanswered in this webinar, we will follow up and share additional inputs and answers after this event. Uh, Amanda, back to you for the facilitation. Okay, thanks, Victoria. Um, so now uh, I'd like to introduce our third speaker, Maria Elena Herrera Ugalde. Maria is a technical coordinator of the National Red Plus Strategy and the National Fund for Forestry Financing of Costa Rica, or FONAFIFO. She is going to present on how uh, climate forest finance can integrate gender equality and women's empowerment principles in practice. Maria Elena, the, the floor is yours. Uh, please turn on your video and unmute. Thanks. Buenos días, me escuchan. Good morning, can you hear me? Thank you very much to UN Red for the invitation to be here. It's an honor for me to be here with you today and share some of the initiatives that we have promoted in Costa Rica at a government level to give participation to women in the processes that we have been working on to build the national red strategy. Now we have an institution in charge of this process. So I'd like to start by giving you more context. Costa Rica is a very small country. We have a little over 50,000 square kilometers. We're divided into seven provinces and our population is roughly 5 million people. Our forest coverage is 52%. And of that forest coverage, to give you some more context, 21% are natural protected forest areas. The environmental payment program is mostly in the hands of private parties. And that's only part of the privatized territories. There are eight indigenous communities in 24 territories. They hold about 10% of the territory in the country and they are a very small population of 104,000 inhabitants. Some of the background that I can share is that in 2016, as part of the process to build the strategy, we analyze gender inequality and gender gaps. And with this information, we came up with a plan to create our strategy. In this study, we found all of the structural gaps in terms of productivity and income, and we realized the need to promote changes. The deputy ministry for the environment in Costa Rica created a directive for all the MINAI organizations to promote actions to reduce gaps in biodiversity, wild protected areas. I'm sorry, Maria Elena, we are not seeing your slides. I don't know if you could help us share them so that we can see your screen. Can you see it now? No, not yet. Okay, hold on. I apologize for this. Let me try it again. Can you see it now? Yes, now we can see you. Okay, perfect. I, I apologize for that. Thank you for letting me know, Victoria. As I was saying, this directive 
led the ministry to establish a partnership with the United Nations program in Costa Rica to receive their support through a program called More Women, More Nature, Más Mujeres, Más Natura, to promote the participation of women in closing gender gaps in the biodiversity and water area. And this program has five pillars. As we started analyzing these gender gaps, we saw that women have a different perception of forests than men. And we also carry out different activities, analogous forests, cattle raising, orchards, organic agriculture, ecotourism, forest management. And we started mapping the participation of women in all of these activities. That way we could understand better how to direct funding to support women. We also realized that of the total registered farms, only 15% are in the hands of women and 85% almost are in the hands of men. This figure comes to show us how wide the gender gap is. And we know that funding cannot be based on property titles because otherwise we will continue to uh, maintain that inequality. Since women are also the primary caretakers at home of the elderly, of children, they often don't have time to receive training, to receive benefits, often because they level of schooling is not as high they don't have access to banks they don't have bank accounts to their names and that makes it very difficult for them to have equal conditions in comparison to men so what we did in the context of this program was we took point number three which was strengthening access to financing and women empowerment as a goal. And we started working with the Vice Ministry of the Environment. And FONAFIFO started to promote a credit called FONAFIFO Atulado. This was all part of the program. And the goal was to promote women participation. This credit has a 4% fixed rate, very favorable conditions for women. It has a 10 year payment period. They fund innovation, but also more simple projects. And often we create payment terms that are very specific to their needs so that they can carry out their activities with the support of FONAFIFO. Something else that we promoted was improving the Payment for Environmental Service Program, PSA, because if women are only landowners of 15% of the land of the country, then how can we guarantee if the program focuses on land ownership and property titles, how can we guarantee that women do have access to this program? So the first thing that we do is a screening at the beginning to analyze the forest areas. And we included a new indicator that said that those farms or those areas in the hands of women would receive 25 additional points. This is another condition that we give to indigenous groups as well. We give them prioritize by giving them additional points in comparison to other um, applications. So we added those 25 points to their applications because that can help them to really compete against other other areas. And in 2021, even with the pandemic, we have managed to, through FONAFIFO a tu lado and another program that is also part of FONAFIFO called PAFT, P-A-F-T, we have managed to give 38 credits to women, making up more than $200,000 just this year. Women need to have open spaces to participate and we must promote these spaces, giving them support. With PSA, what we did was give more contracts to women. And again, in one year, we gave 82 contracts. Maybe the area is not that large, it's less than 4,000 hectares, but they represent over $2 billion for women who are landowners in rural areas who do not have income at the time being, but thanks to this program, they can be benefited because these are 10 year contracts. So payments are distributed annually. 
So as you can see, it is possible to promote even tiny actions that can help increase participation of women. As my panelists, my fellow panelists said before me, it is often hard to receive funding. In Costa Rica, our strategy doesn't really receive specific funding. We've had to approach other organizations to try to attract funding and promote change. One of the challenges that we faced when we created the gender action plan was to create a specific dedicated fund for women for activities related to the land. And it's called Fondo Inclusive de Desarrollo Sostenible, FOINDES, Sustainable Development Inclusive Fund. And FONAFIFO, with the funding strategy for emissions reductions that the country was going to receive, 10% of the first project would be given. And this was the very first project that we worked with. It was a carbon fund in the framework of FSPSF. Of the 60 million that the country received and of the money that FONAFIFO would receive for mitigating gases, a certain percent would be assigned to this fund. And now we have a seed capital of 2.2 million. I'm sorry, Marilena, you only have one more minute. Okay. And there's another fund, the Green Business Fund for Innovation for Women Entrepreneurs. It has a seed capital of 2.1 million, and all of them will be administered by a foundation called FUMBAM. Finally, we created an award, the Gender Equality Award for Productive Units. And this allows us to give recognition to women for their contribution. This will be a yearly award that will be given. It is not a certification, but simply an award for these units. Every October 15th, we will be giving out this award for initiatives that can reduce gaps and promote participation of girls and women in productive units. We want to carry out different activities to connect more producers to access fresh pro, uh, products and to raise awareness among international organizations in order to generate more policies and investments that support these types of initiatives. So we have to gather data because there is a gap. This is a gap that exists in all countries. We do not have this aggregated data. And well, it is important to promote the knowledge among women producers. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Maria Elena. It seems uh, we often look to Costa Rica for, for country level examples of best practice and uh, with good reason, I think. Uh, next, we would like to share a presentation from our fourth speaker, uh, Jeanette Gurung. Jeanette is the executive director for WOCAN, the Women Organizing for Change in Agriculture and Natural Resource uh, Management. Uh, due to time differences, she'll be speaking to us on a pre recorded video to present how climate forest finance can, can integrate gender equality and women's empowerment principles and practice with the example of the, the W uh, plus standard. Her colleague, Maria Elena Vitsaki, the W plus standard coordinator will be available for, for um, question and answer session. Uh, Jessica, could you please uh, launch the video? Thanks. I'm sorry that I'm not able to deliver this PowerPoint. Live. However, my current location in the middle of the Pacific Ocean here in Hawaii makes the timing pretty difficult to do so. So I'm pleased to be able to offer this basic information to you and I'm very happy that my colleague Maria Lena, um, our W plus coordinator, will be attending live and be able to answer any questions you may have. Um, we'd really like to thank um, the organizers for, for inviting Wokan to speak to this webinar audience um, on gender, the key to unlocking transformational change in forest climate finance. This is a topic very near and dear to our hearts um, for which something we've been working on ourselves for quite a long time. So it's, it's really wonderful to see this come to fruition. 
I'm going to speak particularly about Wokan's own work in this field and focus these days, which is on how we can scale impact for both gender and climate using something called the W plus standard. So first of all, let me a very brief introduction to Wokan for those of you who don't know us. Um, we are, we have, I would say these days, uh, we're 16, 17 years old as a global network, but we have this rather unique niche, which is we work on both capacity building and technical assistance for gender integration and women's leadership in forest and other climate sectors. But I'm a forester by training and forestry has always been a fundamental um, sector in which we're involved. And we have the W plus standard. Um, and so this provides us again a niche to find a way to, to be able to measure and quantify women's empowerment benefits within projects um, and then to build this market around the credits that are generated as a result, a kind of a certification. And this is done to incentivize both projects, project developers, as well as fundamentally and really significantly to increase the capital flow of investments and funds for gender-related activities. And Wogan's purpose is to advance women's empowerment and collective action to tackle climate change, poverty, and food insecurity within these enabling environments. Um, and we do so throughout our network uh, and opportunities that come up. We're a network now of about 1,400 members in 114 countries. All of us have expertise in gender, forestry, water resources, and things more technical and come at gender from that technical perspective. Um, we also have selected members, some of you can see this photo, who are what we call our core associates um, from around the world. These are mostly doing training, some research, and also providing technical expertise um, and backstopping for the W plus uh, applications. So we do a lot of gender and climate related services for gender training, gender action plans, um, assessments, research, etc. We do these kind of things for capacity building. Uh, we've worked for most recently, we just finished with uh, Pakistan's Red Plus program. We wrote gender action plans for that. We've done the same thing for GCF in two countries. Uh, forest carbon partnership we offered um, for two countries in Africa. When we offered through Zoom, we offered uh, our gender integrated planning course recently. Um, also working in renewable energy and climate smart agriculture. But these are the kinds of activities um, we're increasingly being requested to provide help with. Um, we think that this results in this increased effectiveness and gender equitable benefit sharing, not just gender action plans. I think this is something we would like to put a focus on now. The gender equitable benefit sharing is a really key aspect of all the red related programs that is just starting i think to get its uh, due recognition for this um it's it's both within projects but as you know there's more and more talk about nature-based solutions and investments from private sector as well there's a lot of opportunities now that didn't exist a few years ago we believe that uh, particularly in forestry and particularly because of the red model, it's it's pretty easy to talk about results-based payment, payment for ecosystem services. Um, we can also do this around carbon credit generating projects. So the idea here is for, for projects that are re um, generating carbon emissions reductions, we can um, work with them to, if they're also generating benefits for women, it's possible for those projects to simultaneously use both standards um, to measure at the same time and come out with something called a W plus labeled carbon credit or a W plus labeled carbon offset, if you want to use that term. This meets the market demands that are growing all the time. We're hearing more and more about how companies and other buyers of, of carbon units are looking for ways to do so um, that produces community benefits or in a way called social co-benefit. Increasingly, we're hearing they're also interested in having SDG impacts or in the world of impact investing, it could be called ESG impacts, environment, social and governance. Um, the, the idea of having a rigorous way to measure those impacts um, is important and allows 
uh, investors in particular and donors to, to, to be sure that what they're funding is in fact having the intended outcomes. So the idea of also returning the revenues to the projects themselves, the funders and women in the, so, so everybody gets a benefit um, out of this kind of measurement. The W plus standard was devised in, I think it was 2014, 2015, when we started to realize that what we were doing for capacity building for gender integration was not sufficient. It was necessary, but not sufficient to get the kind of outcomes we think are needed uh, for projects, for example, in forestry to deliver gender equitable benefits. So we thought that we needed to be able to, we, we learned about the carbon uh, measurement standard and market, and we thought, would it be interesting to try to do something similar to that, but this time focused on social impacts and environmental, I mean, and economic and, and uh, impacts of women's empowerment. So we developed, uh, we talked to women's groups we had relationships with in Nepal and in Kenya, and went to them and said, what does women's empowerment mean to you? What would we measure if we were to develop a, a metrics around this? Uh, they developed these same these same six in both uh, both parts of the world, these same six categories that we call domain that you see here in this wheel. So we then took uh, those six and we designed a methodology using qualitative and quantitative data to be able to come up with a number to quantify the impacts in each of these six areas. So we have those existing methodologies. Um, once a project goes through the, the project of measuring from baseline to monitoring along those, at least one, not necessary to do all six. Uh, if it chooses one and it can show that it's had a measurable impact for women, then we generate what we call W plus credits or W plus units. Um, these, as I said, can be stacked onto or labeled onto a carbon uh, offset or a carbon credit, but it is not necessary to do so. They can be used for any kind of project, um, development project um, or environment pro pro project, does not necessarily have to be measuring carbon. 20% of the revenue of the sale of each of those units, and remember they're tradable assets, they're out there being sold to companies, to governments, to investors. Um, but 20% of that is required by the standard to be granted to women's groups engaged in the project. Very key component is, it, is that these women can use that funding as they deem best fit. They have a lot of great ideas on how to use funds like that for their sake of their community, and they can do so. We won the Momentum for Change, Women for Results Award for this. Uh, back the value is that it, it can be also used as a design document because it has the indicators. So you can start a new project and already know what you're going to be measuring at the end and use the standard to develop a project. Or it could be used to screen uh, across a portfolio as we're doing right now with Shell Foundation. A lot of funders want to see which of the funds, which of the things they're funding are actually having a performance uh, that's that's uh, significant, so they can use it in that way. Uh, and we're doing that already, as I said here, with forest climate projects um, that are funded by some of these uh, organizations. This results in increased gender integration, quality of the project is better, women's involvement is higher quality, um, and it gives investors and funders a, bit, a greater confidence that those results are real, and these are not pink washed, things that people are bragging about when it doesn't actually have any real uh, uh, reality on the ground. And then again, it provides this new revenue source. We're building a new market around um, women's empowerment and particularly women's empowerment that's related to climate mitigation and So feel free to ask more questions to Maria Elena or get in touch with me, but thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. Okay, thank you. Um, very glad that that Will Ken uh, could be part of this event, even um, even remotely, and um, and and share information on W plus. Uh, so our last speaker is Elizabeth Eggert. She is the uh, UN Red Program's gender specialist, based at UNDP, and uh, she leads the program's gender work. Elizabeth is going to tell us how the UN Red Program has supported partner countries and stakeholders 
in integrating gender into climate forest finance initiatives with examples from Colombia, Nigeria, and Vietnam. Elizabeth, the, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Amanda, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Firstly, can everyone hear me okay? Clear, very clear. Perfect, perfect, thanks so much. Um, I just wanna say uh, first, it's uh, great to be engaging with everyone here on this important issue. Um, and to have already heard from some colleagues here on some of the innovative approaches, um, which have illustrated how gender can be effectively integrated into the climate forest finance. Um, so just quickly, before highlighting some of the examples that Amanda noted on how the UN Red Program has supported partner countries and stakeholders in integrating gender into this work, I first wanted to just briefly um, provide an overview on UN Red's gender approach and how the program provides gender support to systematically promote gender equality and a human rights-based approach in the work that we do. So firstly, UN Red's gender approach looks to focus beyond going, um, just looking at gender sensitive um, perspective to instead achieving gender responsive policies and through them more effectively promoting forest protection, combating climate change and enhancing local livelihoods. And to do this, the UN Red program integrates gender equality and women's empowerment, not just as a standalone, but also as a cross country um, theme across its theme, various thematic areas. And within the technical support it provides at local, national, regional and global levels. So in this process, as we see here on this slide, um, the UNRWA program focuses its gender work and support across five core work streams um, to assist state and non-state stakeholders in mainstreaming gender and women's empowerment into Red Plus action. So briefly, these five streams include the following, conducting gender responsive assessments, raising awareness and capacity building on gender equality and uh, women's empowerment concepts, promoting gender responsive participation, undertaking gender responsive planning and monitoring, as well as promoting knowledge management on gender. And so now to illustrate how UN Red implements these streams across its support to UN Red partner countries um, to help ensure that its efforts on forest finance, including the resulting benefits are gender responsive, I will now highlight some key specific examples from UN Red's portfolio of support. So, as we can see here, the first example comes from a community Como based pueden ver aquí, el primer ejemplo viene de uno de los proyectos comunitarios de un río en Nigeria. Para darles un poco de antecedentes, Red Más, con base, basado en la comunidad, surgió de una alianza entre el programa UN de ONU Red y el programa de pequeñas subvenciones para cuestiones ambientales que busca dar apoyo a comunidades y pueblos indígenas para empoderarlos en actividades relacionadas con Red Más y ay ayudarlos para desarrollar experiencias, lecciones y recomendaciones a nivel local que después pudiera servir para procesos nacionales de Red Más. Siguiente, por favor. to help support the integration of gender into this work. In the case of Nigeria, its country plan included gender-related outputs, gender requirements among criteria um, for project selection, as well as gender targets and indicators. And as a result, key selected projects supported women and youth on eco-agricultural practices, as well as sustainable livelihood enterprises. And as you can see here, um, here are some examples on some of the impact on this work on women's livelihoods. Um, and somebody just want to highlight some noteworthy um, results. So first, um, um, the work provided semi-mechanized equipment that created the time savings for women. Um, the women were also trained on sustainable harvesting methods, and they were involved in decision-making processes on the community forestry plan. Um, there was um, increased uh, income generating activities for women, as well as there was a community recognition um, and support from women that had actually been approved upon. Now, while these gender related results for women from this project are great to showcase, it's also key to highlight that doing so promo also promotes more successful forest management and Red Plus action. And this is exactly what a community leader that was involved in this project um, noted. 
Um, he, he was quoted as saying, we have learned that successful forest management will be better for us when there is social cohesion, political will, and protective livelihoods. And he noted that we've developed a community forest plan with bylaws and we have started to regenerate degraded forest sites, improve the livelihoods for women, and also improve the value chain for cocoa, the major, major driver for forest loss. So um, I wanted to highlight one other, another example, and this one now comes from some uh, community forest management support that we conducted in Colombia. Um, Jessica, next slide, please. So, Firstly, a bit of background on this work. Um, it was done with the La Cristalina Initiative in Colombia, and it was um, undertaken in partnership with Colombia's uh, Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development, as well as with the European Union to promote community forest management in eight subregions in the country. Um, next slide, please, Jessica. So, and to ensure that this support equitably involved and benefit, including financially, women and men, and reflected both their needs and priorities, a gender approach was mainstream within it. Um, and following the work streams of the UN Red approach, we can see here that first a baseline data, um, uh, baseline data was collected, um, and this data revealed that and within and within the La Cristalina initiative that all representatives of households were men at the, at the, at the baseline conditions. Almost 65% of households um, and within households decisions were made by men and not women. And no women attended community forestry meetings. So in response to this, the project um, in support with and in collaboration with the um, community leader, they built the capacity of women on the project they undertook gender responsive stakeholder engagement activities to ensure that 50% of those involved in forest inventory activities were actually women, as well as ensure that women were, it, were um, part of the forestry committee and were assisting in the management of the initiative's monetary fund. And what's, what's interesting about um, some of these key results is that now, starting with the baseline of having no women participate, women now make up 34% of the attendees within decision-making processes. Also, through consistent consensus, it was decided that 20% of the income generated from the product activities will go to the Women's Committee of La Cristalina because of the role they actually played in all the implementation activities. So this actually goes to show that when women are, are, women are fully engaged in the process, those involved in decision-making processes, including both women and men, often see the value that women bring to the table within a project. And there's this need to ensure that they also receive some of its benefits and that's crucial. Um, and so this also illustrates the need to make sure that women are just not beneficiaries but are involved throughout the project implementation as well as decision-making as well. Okay, so I'm just going to show one more example with the one last minute I have. Um, and this one comes from the uh, uh, phase two of Vietnam's uh, UN Red program. And um, this illustrates how efforts to develop markets and partnerships in Lao Cai province for natural forest-based economic models can um, support the active participation of women. Next slide, please, Jessica. So really, really really briefly, just to highlight that in this work, public-private partnerships were piloted between the provincial government and ethnic minority communities. And under this work, traditional medicines managed and harvested according to indigenous knowledge um, are being sold by local women to partner companies that provide the market access that the women previously had lacked. And in this process, the support has also involved um, complementing women's knowledge with training on sustainable harvesting techniques to help, as well as help them set up cooperatives at the commune level um, comprised of women involved in the harvesty, uh, harvesting of uh, the plants. So for local women who are dependent on the forest for their income, these partnerships have had a significant impact on their livelihoods through one, increasing their incomes and two, securing a viable future for both their traditional knowledge as well as the sustainable use of forest. And it just quickly goes to highlight the valuable traditional knowledge of women and ethnic minorities and how they can be powerfully leveraged um, in the care and stewardship of forest and red plus action. Um, so, and it actually shows that we can then scale this up 
to operate at a more influential scale to talk to achieve this more transformational change that we've been talking about today. So with that, I will stop and thank you so much. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. It's, it's really great to have these concrete examples of, of how gender responsive finance can, can impact on the ground. Um, now I'd like to turn the floor back to Victoria for our second um, and final round of, of questions and answers. Thanks, Victoria. Thank you. Yes, um, I would like to encourage the participants to put their questions or comments in the chat box. And please um, tell us if a specific question is directed to one or of the three presenters of these uh, final presentations. Um, and we can take maybe one question, one verbal question from a person, if you could please uh, raise your hand um, to let me know that uh, you want to, to share your question. I see one hand raised. Uh, please, uh, Manuelita, go on. Hi, Victoria. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much. If I could actually do two questions. I have one question for Maria Elena and one question for Elizabeth. So um, I think from all um, this gender mainstreaming that has been done in, uh, in Costa Rica's land use sector policy, there's a lot of lessons learned for, for Colombia, where I'm based. And I would like to ask uh, Maria Elena, because I found really interesting this way to promote um, women access to um, environmental services payments, um, if there is something included in the programs or in the plans related to promoting access to land, which it was very low in the, in the numbers um, you exposed. And also ask um, Elizabeth about how uh, in this red program in Colombia, um, how participation for, of women was enhanced and how um, you kind of break down these cultural barriers um, that um, stop women from, from participating in such uh, decision-making instances. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Maria Elena, would you like to start uh, with your question? So please, um, como, como se, eh, promovió... so again, I'll ask the question, how did you managed to help women to have access to land because this was a problem identified in the baseline. Yes, thank you very much, Manuelita, for your question. In our strategy, it is very clear to us that land ownership is a problem that has affected women for a very long time, and not only women, but also indigenous groups because uh, a white civilization has invaded land. But if we want to promote actions single-handedly, it's impossible. So what the strategy has attempted to do is work together with INDERT, which is the Institute for Rural Development in Colombia, together with the Ministry for Agriculture and Cattle Raising, because lands that women can have productive access to is already used for plantations of plantains, corn, and other crops. So everyone needs to participate if we want to grant access to land for women. What the Ministry of the Environment can do is not much because we don't have direct decision-making in that area, but the Ministry of Agriculture does have land in their possession. And therefore, to promote a change, what the ministry has attempted to do was draft a bill which is currently being discussed in the legislature and it's called the TUA law. The idea is to try to fight against this inequality in terms of land ownership, not only for women, but also men in the case of indigenous groups, because if someone receives ownership for a land and then it becomes, for instance, a national protected area or a national park and the person can no longer have uh, benefits from that land, then that represents a problem for them. Another policy was implemented by the Ministry of Agriculture last year together with INDER, the Institute for Rural Development, where for every hectare 
given to a man, two or three hectares must be given to women. This new policy seeks to bridge the gap and give women more access to land titles in, in their name. But this, of course, will move very slowly. So at the same time, I think we have to use other schemes that are not necessarily related to land ownership so that women can participate. This is what we're trying to do through our new funds that we that I introduced earlier. We believe that it is not only land ownership titles that give access to land to women. There are many actions and activities that women can take in order to help fight against climate change. Thank you, Maria Elena. Example of an action on how um, participation of women was enhanced in the case of uh, the Colombia, ex Colombian example? Sorry, I have an itch in my throat. <laughs> Perfect timing. Um, no, thank you very much for the question. And I think what was key was, um, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> was ensuring that um, one, one of the huge hurdles was women's own capacity about the project. They didn't know much about it to know they should be engaging in it. And also supporting their own involvement in that within the community. And second, um, what was also done was the engagement of the community leaders in the process and in their support so that that message was then communicated to the whole community. So and I think that actually helps to resonate more with the men who are already participating within the decision-making processes. <clears throat> Sorry about this, I'm getting over a cold. Um, so with that, I think those were the two, a huge contributing factor. Um, but I did want to add, we have actually done a couple of newsletter articles within you and read on this key work in community, community forestry within Colombia because it had so many good practices and lessons learned that came out of that through the, I'm just from the collection of date baseline data to the steps that were taken as well as to what was then implemented on the ground and the results achieved. And I would be happy to send that to um, share those links with this group as well post the meeting. Um, just to let you know, because we will be sharing um, responses to comments and issues raised as well with the registered participants of this group. So this can also be a start and a continuation of knowledge sharing. So I'll make sure to include the links to highlight more specifics on how uh, women's participation was enhanced in this work as well. So I hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Elizabeth. And now before we go into the um, closing remarks of this webinar, we would like to take a minute for a poll to hear on um, your opinion of this webinar and perhaps if you would like to continue this discussion or be engaged in, in future events that uh, we could promote. Could you help me? Um, yeah, so now you will see the, the poll in your screen. Please answer the three questions and submit your responses.
Yes, and Jessica, could you confirm if you are seeing the responses from the participants? Yeah, we have 54 people who've responded, 54 uh, percent of everyone responded so far. So maybe just 30 more seconds. If anyone else would like to respond, it will really help us inform future events. I'm seeing quite positive response so far. So thank you, everyone. So if anyone else left would like to respond before we go for our closing remarks. Also, we will continue to have the democracy board open for a few days. If you want to put information after this webinar on your organization, um, examples that you know of, of existing um, examples in the practice. And also you could post questions or additional comments. So um, please use the, this tool in case you want to share further information. Now we can see the, the answers in, in the screen. This is for the first question regarding the expectations and if this exchange met the expectation, expectations. For the most part, um, yeah, it, we are toward the end of the scale. Most people found it um, uh, useful and it met the expectations. Regarding the, the second uh, question, if people would like to participate in additional discussions, uh, the majority uh, say yes. So we will be reaching out and finding other opportunities to continue these um, exchanges and, and future discussions on the topic. And finally, the third question on um, whether the workshop gave, gave the participants ideas on how to integrate gender into climate forest finance. Um, again, well, there's a majority of people um, indicated that um, they it did give them ideas um, for the most part. I think um, without later delay, I would like to uh, welcome again uh, Mario Bocucci for the closing remarks. He is um, the head of UN Red Program Secretar Secretariat. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Victoria and all colleagues. I know uh, we are five minutes um, beyond the scheduled end, so I'll be super quick and I want to do only two things. <laughs> the first one is really to thank everyone, all of the participants who stayed with us here today and those that are going to watch um, the recording of um, this uh, event because they couldn't join us today, so a big thank you for the question, the comments, and for the participation. I also want to thank the speakers, starting from uh, you know, those who stayed up very late in the evening, IBTT, Trima Kasibanyak, Salamati Dur, when you finally get to that point, but also you know, Karina, Jeanette, uh, Maria, Elena, and, um, and, and Beth. Thank you. Your intervention was superb and really helped us frame the issue very nicely. And also, I would like to thank uh, the team, the UN Red team that has worked to, you know, tirelessly to, to make this um, event possible. Again, Beth, uh, Victoria, Amanda, but, that you have seen, but also those behind the scenes, Elspeth, uh, Jessica, Katrina, and Florian, and many others. So a big thank you to all of you. Now, my final point is really on how do we build on what we heard uh, today? You know, to me, I, <laughs> I've listened to every word uh, that you've been saying. You know, for me, it was, I'm Italian, and it was like as if I was eating a wonderful ice cream and I didn't want to stop. It was so rich. To me, there's clearly uh, a massive level and amount of work and evidence and commitment on the ground of what it takes to leverage gender responsive finance at the scale that is needed. And as I said at the beginning, we're moving into a different era. Glasgow is gonna be a major turning point 
in, because it will send the signal, the finance will start to flow at scale for climate in general, but specifically for forest. And we're talking an unprecedented level of finance hmm, that is gonna flow. I, what I would like to avoid, and I think all of us we want to avoid, is that we repeat what we have seen in the past. For example, that forest um, was receiving only 2% of the overall climate finance. And if you look even at the COVID recovery packages, the 11 trillions that have been uh, uh, deployed so far, there it's only less than 2% that grows for green activities in general, of which almost very little has got to do with forest. So in order to avoid uh, the repeat of this, whereby we see only a marginal limited amount of finance that goes for gender responsive uh, intervention, I think we need to prepare now. And what I would like to propose that, of course, this event is only a step in that direction. And then we start considering a very solid knowledge management product that basically does three things. The first one, it makes the case for investing for a gender responsive investment. And it makes the case on the basis of the evidence that we started to share today of the actions that have already been taken on the ground, on the benefits that they generate, and therefore the rationale for investing for gender responsive investments in, in forest actions. So that's the first one, making the case. The second one, I think it was also in response from the colleague from uh, Nigeria, I think it was uh, whoever. You know, to, let's do a review of the international uh, climate and forest financing avenues and opportunities that there are out there. You've heard the number from, uh, from Katrina, from the Green Climate Fund. There's a number of other climate finance opportunities. There's the private sector, there are the bilaterals. There's a really significant amount of forest finance. Let's map it out and let's get a sense of how much of the finance is already geared to be gender responsive. And let's see what is the gap that we need to fill. And that will take me to the third point that this knowledge management could do. Why don't we develop a strategy to really access and leverage that finance so that we do not find ourselves in the coming years where there's you know, less than 2% of that you know, unprecedented level of finance that goes into forest that is um, only uh, gender responsive. Because as we've heard, if that happens, we are not going to succeed not with the climate objective, not with the development objective, not with any other objective that we have to address this planetary crisis. So with that, again, a big thank you to uh, you all. Uh, we look forward you know, continuing to build these partnerships and um, let us know if you have any other feedback, any other inputs, and otherwise you will hear from us very soon because we really want to make and to give the best that we have to make gender responsive finance successful and a reality over a short period of time. Thank you so much. Back to you.